So at this time, as we begin this day here, I'll put up the first screen, but before I begin to speak on today's message, which is titled, Enter God's Rest, I would like to have my wife speak to you. She and I have been talking much about a lot of different things, about the renewal of the mind and about the work that has to be done and the labor that needs to be done. And I wanted her on this special day here to share to everyone here from her heart before we begin the main part of the message. Go ahead. Um, just wanted to explain how this came about. Last Monday, early morning, I, a lot of times I get up in the middle of the night and go out on the couch, <clears throat> listen to something or pray or something, and I did that, and I was listening to a, a YouTube thing where it's like 10 hours of scriptures, and it was on rest. And as I was listening to it, this one verse came across, and I thought, huh, and I stopped, went back, listened to it, found the reference, and I thought, I'm going to read more on this. And it's the scripture that he has up there. It's in Hebrews 4, 9 to 11. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he has also ceased from his own works, as God did from his. <clears throat> Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And the unbelief he's talking about is prior to this, the, talks, the chapters talk about the children of Israel, how they entered into unbelief and fell in the wilderness. Even though they, saw, they came out of Egypt, even though they saw the mighty miracles of God, their unbelief still kept them from the rest that they were actually promised. And so as I was thinking about this, the Lord showed me many different things about rest and what it can relate to different areas of your lives. And, um, and then a couple days later, I was just sharing this with Mark, and he said, that's really interesting, because I have a note on my desk that that same scripture, and he said, and I'm thinking I'm doing a message on it. So that's how this came about. So when it talks about rest, entering to his rest, yes, it definitely means enter, entering heaven receiving that final destination of rest. But it can also mean many other things. And what kind of seemed ironic when I read this was, let us labor to enter into that rest, which sounds, you know, you got to work to rest. But it is true. I mean, how many people, how many, you know yourself, in order to get something done, like even like before you go on vacation, you got all kinds of work you got to do just to be able to go on vacation and take some day, time off. There's always a labor into something, a work. And I was thinking about the testimony that I had given a couple weeks ago of how with this move that we've done and how um, through the whole thing, I've never been anxious or panicky or overwhelmed. It's just been a constant flowing rest and how that wasn't normal and that's not me and how and I thought about what it took to get to that place of just trust and rest was a lot of work a lot of labor a lot of being in the word a lot of praying a lot of praying in tongues a lot of listening to messages a lot of um actual doing it making myself okay you know I'm going to just chill right now I'm going to be okay there's a, there's a work <clears throat> to entering into the rest. And that rest can mean entering into a peace, a state of no anxiety. It can mean entering into a victory in your healing. There's a lot of push, things you've got to do to, um, to get to where then you start to see that manifestation of a healing. And I know that for a fact in my own body, in my hands. And, and now, because they're healed, now I can labor in great peace and satisfaction and do lots of work. And there's a, there's a peace in that labor. 
it can be in knowing that your problems are taken care of financially, a lot of anxiety things. There's, there's, a, there's a way in God to achieve a victory. And when we, um, in, the, in the scriptures here, it's talking about Nehemiah. He talks about the inter- rest. There's a rest for the people of God. God's, God spoke it. There's a rest that we can be in. And for he that is entered into that rest, he has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. So what that's saying here is when, when God made the earth, for, for um, six days he labored, he created, he figured this out, he put into place, he, you know, he brought to manifest his, ma- his master plan of life. And when he was done, he was like, it is good. And he saw what he had done, and he had put into place in this earth not only just what was needed then, but he created the earth, people, plants, everything to replenish itself, to continue to keep going. It wasn't just, okay, this is it, and this is how it is. He put in there so that as he knew that as man multiplied, there was going to be needed more food, more of this. He put in for the, how he created um, the oxygen and the water system, you know, and the evaporation and the, the whole cycle of purification. There's just so many things that like that he put in the, into his plan and created. And when he was done, it was like, okay, this is finished. I'm a, and, he, and he went into a rest. And that's how it has to be with us when we have to go into the rest of, that's in God and know that there's a finished work that's already been done. And when Jesus died and he took those stripes and he took those beatings and he took those bruises, he bore everything. He bore anxiety, he bore healing, he made a way for our salvation, for cleansing of the past. Um, He made a way that we could be his children, children of God, that we could be prosperous and, and bold before the throne of God. And he made a way for all that. But for many people to understand that, it takes a labor. It takes getting in the word. It takes getting to know God more. It takes understanding. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't just come. And, and as you labor, the rest comes. The peace comes. The understanding comes. Sometimes I actually think, I look at myself and think, wow, I know I was not there. I mean, this is not, this took something to get me to this place. This place of trust. This place of, of um, because in faith is rest. In trust is rest. Think about when you ever learned or you taught someone how to float on their back. Once you get it, it's so easy to just go flip right into it and just float there quietly. I remember in my pool, just me by myself, just peaceful floating. But to get to that point, that very first couple times to just like you know, no, I'm going to sink. No, no, come on, trust me. Come on, just do this and do that. And you don't even have to understand the whole physics behind the whole thing that God put into plan that we could float. You just have to do it. And, but once you get it, the, the peace that comes with it, and, and, um, and you can go into that rest. And there's many things that also take labor in our lives to, to in different areas of rest, such as if, if you can make things easier for yourself in life, it's more peaceful. If you constantly live in a state of commotion, confusion, you know, you, ha- you live in a, a house or a situation that's constantly just, you don't know where anything ever is, and it's just, well, you know, that's a, it just creates more anxiety. If you can labor to become more organized, to become more efficient, to become more um, 
in, in any of those ways, it just makes life easier. It makes it peaceful. It makes it calmer. There's a way to, to for God's people to, the wisdom that he's given us to, to do that. Um, you can enter into a pace of rest physically so that, you know, well, I'm not sleeping good or I've got this issue or, um, you know, I just, I'm always, you know, I need to lose weight. I just don't, my body's just not functioning right, blah, blah, blah. There's a way to enter into God's rest that he has given to the people of God, but it is a labor and you have to be determined and you have to ask God, now, how, how does this happen? I mean, how, what, 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 what should I be doing? Give me some wisdom. What steps should I take? And I just want to share a testimony about a sister in here. And I hope she doesn't care I share this. It's Margaret. She felt the same way. She felt, I want to be freer in God. I want to go deeper into God. But I know physically I'm just limited. I, there's issues with my body. I can tell. I'm overweight. I've got, you know, I need to do something. And so she just cried out to the Lord. And he brought in her path um, a lady who wrote a book, a Christian lady, on, um, it's called The 30-Day Detox. So she, in, she in, in, uh, looked into it, checked into it all, and thought, you know, this looks interesting. This looks... So she got the book. She studied the book. She took notes. She figured out how this could work for her. She wrote down a, a, a game plan. She wrote down a menu plan, and she had it all ready, and she thought, okay, and so like, I think like in two weeks I'll be able to start this and do it. I mean, that was a labor. That was a work. And in her 30-some days, she lost 30 pounds. And she's also, not only that, she's got a whole new mindset on food, on eating, on what her body needs and doesn't need, on what she wants to see going forward. Because she labored, now she's in a rest of, I can do this, and I can become what God wants me to become. And, and I just encourage everyone in here to self-examine yourself in all kinds of areas. If it's, you want more of God, I want to hear God more. I want to develop the gifts that he's given me more. Well, labor. And it says, ask, God says, if you ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you. But then, what are you going to do with it when he does? What are you going to do with the, uh, the, the strategy plan that he pours out? Are you going to act on it? And I was reading in, um, also it brought me to that place in Nehemiah 4, 6, where the people had a mind to work. And the story of Nehemiah was where the walls had been torn down when they had gone into captivity. And they um, had a mind to work. So they labored and labored and got it like halfway done. And when they got to that point, the enemy really did not want them to continue and be a success. And they really attacked them and were basically attacked them mentally with words, with the words of discouragement. And they were also ready to attack them physically, but it was mostly they were trying to just weary them down, like, you know, this, we can't do this. Well, then Nehemiah comes along and he says, yes, we can. And he comes up with a strategy. You know, some are going to work while well, some stand guard and we're going to switch off and we're going to keep this going and it's going to be by families and you're going to work together and we can do this and we can do this and and they did but the reason it says because they had a mind to work that was the success they put their mind to it and they they were determined and we can do that but i and i want to leave you with that thought okay do I, is it in my heart, and do I have that mind to overcome in this area, to enter into this rest, to accomplish this in this area of my life? Because God says that there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. He's, he wants it for you. How badly do you want it? That was excellent. That was good. And it really provided a very good segue into the message to this morning. Because when we talk 
about entering into God's rest, there's a lot of scripture that we can share. We'll begin, we'll touch on a few of those scriptures that I feel will help us and it will also give us some insight into truly how really fearfully and wonderfully made we are when we talk about what God has promised each and every one of us. You see, entering into the Lord's rest is actually a lot bigger than just sitting down with a a cup of chamomile tea and the word. And you can tell I don't even know what that tea is supposed to be pronounced like there because I don't like that tea, all right? It is so bland, but I'm, I, I know that it touts the calming effect of something in it that makes you just kind of settle down. Well, entering into God's rest is a, a whole lot more. When Jesus told people to enter into his rest, he was referencing two things. Number one, that he would give rest to those who were actively laboring. And number two, those who labor are laboring to make their calling and election sure, to know of the assurance of their inheritance, that is, eternal life, a promised land of rest. Let's go to that next screen, please. Turn with me, if you will, to the second book of Timothy. If you've got your Bible, open it up, or a Bible app. There are Bibles on the back table. They are available for you to take. They're free. But let's study the Word together. Today's message will be a lot of reading God's Word. And so, if you flip to the second book of Timothy, go to chapter 4. We'll begin reading in verse 6. 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 6. Timothy is concluding his writings here, saying, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Verse 8, henceforth. Henceforth means because of this. Because I sowed, because there is a law of sowing and reaping, henceforth, because of the fact that I have diligently kept the faith, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That's what we look forward to. This is the promise that we have been given. But it involves, just as Timothy said here in these verses, I have kept the faith because I have kept the faith, because I actively labored now. I know there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me. There is a rest that I can look forward to in eternal glory. Entering God's rest is done by faith. Timothy understood this. He declared, I have kept the faith. It's an active word. Rest is an active word that is likened unto a race. A race that in order to win, 
you must first finish. Amen? If you're going to be in a race, doesn't mean anything if you just start off on the first lap and just kind of head back to the concession stand. Okay? Finishing a race is what this is all about. Finishing the race that we are in. This life, we must first finish. In a race that when completed, there is a crown of righteousness that is received. It says in Jeremiah 50, verse 6, Jeremiah says, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. That's found in Jeremiah 50. Jeremiah was speaking of the fact that people need to understand that there is a purpose, there is a vision in our lives, and that is to stay the course. It is to stay in the race. It doesn't matter if you're running the fastest or if you're on the last part of it there. It is important that you keep the faith because the end is near. We see that happening. We see it, and it is important that we are not complacent. Today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. If we are complacent today, if we don't actively do what is needed, what you know acting in all the light that you have, if you don't do it, if you aren't actively laboring, you become complacent. And that complacency will bring you into captivity. Plain and simple. Again, it's the law of sowing and reaping. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, that we're actually supposed to labor to enter into his rest and to come boldly to his throne to obtain the mercy and to find grace in the time of our need. And again, we'll cover more on this here in just a little bit. Go to that next screen, please. Rest is not equal to bliss or comfort. Okay? It's actually a position of authority. Rest is a position of authority. It is appointed and approved. It's a seat. When I looked up the word rest in Strong's Concordance, it comes from a, a word, katapawo. Again, probably mispronouncing that. But that word, that Greek word, means this. It's an abode. It means to cease, to stop. It means to desist, cut. It also means to, and I like this definition, to colonize. So I want you to think, the word rest, it means from that Greek word to colonize. It means to set roots, to do the active labor that you need, to exercise faith day by day, hour by hour, so that you can take it over. You can establish your roots, and you can colonize your future. Amen? The root word of that Greek word, katapao, kata, means three different things. Opposition, distribution, and intensity. 
So many of these applications here are quite different than what we in our minds think of rest. How can rest be synonymous with opposition? Think about it. The cares of this world are things that are in opposition to our lives. The things of the world, the things that are not of God, they are in opposition preventing us from going into rest. Romans 12.1 speaks it out. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living, a holy sacrifice, and that your mind would be renewed in the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things that that word, the root word of kata, means in rest. Second word up on the screen says distribution. How can rest have anything to do with distribution. The words don't even seem to be at all in agreement. But distribution is very much a part of rest. Faith is like a channel. Am I right? Faith in God is a channel from God Almighty down into your soul, into your heart, renewing your mind. And it's a medium, if you will, between you and God. So distribution in order to enter into that rest is, yeah, exactly what it says. God's Word says, be still and know that I am God. The power of still is saying to us, he is still on the throne, the power of still. And it even says in Ephesians, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So yes, distribution, that channel of faith is all a part of actively laboring to enter into his rest. And the last word on the screen is intensity. Again, how can rest have anything to do with intensity? Rest is seriously a place that you have labored to get in, to stay in, and to abide. What's Psalm 91 begin with? Under the shadow of the Almighty there is a secret place. There is a rest that we can abide in. How? Faith. Again, that all comes down into what God is wanting us, where he wants us to be, and where we can, as born-again Christians, filled with the Holy Ghost, it's a natural place for us to be. What Psalms 23 say to us, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me into that quiet place where even in the presence of my enemies, I'll eat. He spread a table before me so that I have all that I need in that place, in that rest. Amen. Does this make sense to you? Amen. Say amen. Let's go to that next screen, please. So that brings us to some of the verses here that my wife was speaking of at the beginning in Hebrews chapter 3 and in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, read with me. Some powerful stuff here that 
begins Hebrews 3, verse 7, saying this, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. I pause there because that is a scary thing. <laughs> yeah, it is a, a fearful thing to think that there would be anything that could cause you to go a different direction than in running the race that will allow you to enter into his rest. It's a fearful thing. First Corinthians chapter 10, turn with me. Paul writes by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and he says these words. First Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Paul is saying, listen, the word of God was written so that we would understand, not be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud. Paul knew this to the letter. He understood every bit of the law. And he said, you better not be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Pause. Scary stuff. Verse 6, now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Verse 11, now all these things happened unto them for examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. They are for our examples to read and to understand that the things that they did led them away from their faith in God. Back to Hebrews chapter 3, beginning to read here in verse 12. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That's why we gather on a morning like this. We gather and assemble ourselves together so that we can encourage one another, so that we can admonish one another with, again, words of wisdom and worship and allow, again, our spirits to be lifted up 
so that we can get the strength that we need to go in to yet another day, another week. Amen? Verses 18 and 19 in Hebrews 3 says this, And to whom swear that he and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see, so we see, so we see, they could not enter in because of unbelief. Remember the verses in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Go to that a minute. The king, Saul, entering into a battle against Amalek. His instructions were, destroy everything in that country. They are wicked, they are being judged, and for that time, that was the word to King Saul, given by the man of God, Samuel, saying this, destroy them all. Comes down to, and the story goes, that he listened to some of the people who said, well, don't kill all of the animals because, hey, we can make some money off of these. We can get some profit off of this. And, hey, there's some cool stuff that these Amleks have uh, in their tents here. Take some of the good stuff. Only the good stuff. It's okay. We want to keep part of that. And Saul listened to the people. Samuel comes and he hears the, the bleeding of the goats. He hears all of the people rummaging through all of their newfound treasures like they just you know, came back from a bargain store. And Samuel says, what's going on, Saul? And Saul said, well, I've obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I've gone the way that the Lord sent me. I'm reading from verse 20 of chapter 15, 1 Samuel. And he said, I've, I've done it all. I did what you told me to do. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord. They took it because we were going to give it back to the Lord and we were going to make kind of a nice party. Okay? Samuel said, verse 22, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And it goes on to say, because you, Saul, rejected the word of the Lord, you are rejected as king at this time. Pause. Scary stuff. Think about the seriousness of our walk. Hebrews 4, go with me. Starting in verse 1, we read, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, amen, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. There's the key. You know, the parting of the Red Sea, the cloud by day, the fire by night, all of the miraculous works, all the judgments against Pharaoh and against the land of Egypt, all of those things, it should have been enough to encourage the people to hold on to the promises of God and push them ahead into, yeah, God, do it again. Yea, God, 
Let's see you do more. Increase more, Lord. More favor here. But doubt works through the mind and causes unbelief. Even when things are obvious. That's unbelief. Verse 3 of Hebrews 4. Continue reading with me. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest. Had he read that? He did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. God provided a way to enter in to that rest clear back at the beginning. The children of Israel were given that opportunity, but it says plainly for our examples that they entered not in because of unbelief. Verse 7, again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David. Now remember, David is long after Moses and De uh, Joshua, okay? Says, saying in David, today after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So the promise, the good news is this. There remains a rest that we can press into. Thank God. Go to that next screen here. I want to keep reading in Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 9 says, There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For the, he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Now please catch that. If we are to truly enter in to his rest, follow the example of God Almighty. I think that's pretty good, you know, judgment, all right? I think that's pretty wise to say. If you want to follow somebody, go to the top. See what he did. God rested from his own works on that seventh day. It says to do the same. Let us labor, therefore, verse 11, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. It's hitting it hard. It's making it plain. It's saying, don't get caught in that old man, that old way. Because when we, as Christians, surrendered our hearts, our lives, gave them over to God Almighty, we declared, I'm dead. I'm no longer my own. What is mine does not matter. I don't want to be trying to do works or things to get into a place. God said, you've been given the measure of faith. You have been given all things pertaining to life and to godliness. Am I right? Just quoting the word. Go with me to Numbers 13. Numbers 13. It's a portion of the Old Testament that again speaks loudly to each and every one of us. It's about the time when it 
the 12 spies were sent into the promised land, Canaan. Okay? It was the time when the 12 leaders that were carefully chosen by Moses to go in and to scope out the land. They were to see what's it all about, what's in there. Come back with that report. And we understand what happened here if you go to verse 30. We'll skip some of the, the story part of it because you should know that. But it's good reading. Go back to Numbers 13 on your own. But in verse 30 it says, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. Understand that Caleb, in speaking this, was in opposition to the ten of the twelve spies who were saying, you can't, we can't go up there. This land is full of giants. It is full of stuff that we were just like grasshoppers in their eyes. It is absolutely no way that we can do what you're thinking even though they knew as leaders in Israel, as a part of the leadership team at that time who were chosen, they said, nah, I choose to discard the promises and what I heard God say. Because God has spoken to them, I will give you that land. I will take you into that promised land. It's yours. I'll go before you. I've given it to you. I've given it to you. It's yours. But they said, no, they're too big. They're too big. We're like grasshoppers. Caleb says, stop it. Come on, stop it. We are well able. I know whom I have served. I know what God has promised to me. His word is true. It will never fail. Verse 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sights as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sights. They confessed it. They declared it right on themselves. The fruit of their lips spoke the death into their life. So we were in their sight. When words such as, I can't help but to worry. Or I can't help but to feel this way. I, I, I just can't help it. When those words come out of your mouth, brothers and sisters, we are allowing a spirit of unbelief to enter into our lives, plain and simple. Again, the law of sowing and reaping is applicable to every person that hears this word. You will eat the fruit of your lips. 14th chapter of Numbers, verse 7 begins and it says, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with them. Fear them not. Who is speaking that? Caleb and Joshua. Quite a bit different than what we just read, right? Totally opposite sides. Verse 10 says, 
of Numbers 24, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Pause. Some of you might think, well, this is kind of a weird Mother's Day message. <laughs> this is a message, if you've noticed, we have been quoting Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. It is a message that actually does provide us with great hope. It does provide us with the encouragement that we all need to understand that there is a place that if we are to enter into his rest, we have a labor, we have a work, we have a mind to work. Even as it was brought out in the days of Nehemiah when they were building the wall, the people were united together, locked arm in arm, and they said, our God can do it. The words that are going to be spoken in your ears are what we just read, that you should not fear the people. You, sh you got to understand that their bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. It's like I heard spoken by a person uh, not too long ago. Affliction does not move me. I move affliction. Because again, I know where I stand in the Lord here. The Lord, it says, is with us. Fear them not. And even though there will be others that will stand beside you and say, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go that way. Know this. We are well able to go up and possess the land. We are well able, brothers and sisters, to go up at once. Isaiah chapter 30 Verse 15 says, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength, and you would not. It is in the Spirit of God that we are going to find our peace. We're going to find our grace. We're going to find our joy, that quickening spirit. We're going to find the hope and the rest that has been promised to each and every one of us. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17 says, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. So when others look at you, they should see the witness of someone who is at peace. Even though there are waves, things coming against them, even though you know that maybe they are in a battle, your witness should remain, I am at peace. Assured, I have hope, I have confidence. On the other side, if you are exhibiting fear and anxiety and stress, like many people in the world choose to do, you are not carrying the witness of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said in his word, be careful for nothing. Be careful. Don't even give it place for anything because you've got the Lord Jesus Christ behind you. He says, take no thought for the morrow. Faith has no worry, period. Next screen, please. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus, in his words, said this, come unto me, all ye laboring and burdened ones, 
Are we laboring to enter into his rest as we are commanded? Yes. Now Jesus says, come unto me, you who are laboring, because we are, we're working, we're doing what it takes to exercise faith every day in our lives. Come unto me, all ye laboring and burdened ones, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am meek and humble in heart and you shall find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Promise of God right there. Now for some of you car buffs, I pulled this picture up and I didn't recognize the car. And I could not figure out what kind of car it was. I couldn't read the front part of that bumper. It kept saying something ending in ward. And then it looked like something like, I just couldn't, couldn't read it. So I took a, saved it as a picture, blew it up. And that car, rusty as it shows there, is a car that is manufactured back in 1949. It's German-made. It's a Borgward Hansa, H-A-N-Z-A. I mean, I, I mean, I thought it'd be interesting for you all, okay, just to know that that is a Borgward Hansa, okay? Kind of hard to see that picture, so go to the next screen here. That's what a Borgward Hansa looks like when it's restored. Why do I show these pictures? Good question, Mark. Because that's what God does when he restores you. That is what the word of God, when we take it in and we begin to understand all of the promises of God that he gave to us on the finished work, from the finished work of the cross. We, we, in our previous old man, we were rusty, our headlight, go to the previous one there, go back one there. We, our, our picture, our life was, like that old car, just about rusted out. The one headlight on that one side is just hanging there. We had nothing of value, couldn't even hardly read the make of that car. Go to the next screen. This is what happens when we let God take our lives and renew it, restore it. Because God has reconciled through Jesus Christ man back to God. That's a picture of our lives there. Let me close with this thought here. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, the last part of Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about a great high priest. Jesus Christ. Do you know, before we read that, do you remember the story of the woman at the well that Jesus said to her, she came, he asked her to draw water, and she says, why are you, I mean, you're a Jew, uh, why would you ask me, you know, this, I think she was a Syrian, Okay, whatever. Samaritan. There you go. Thank you. He said, why would you even be talking to me? And so Jesus reaches out to her and he tells her things in her life. And Jesus says, go back to your husband. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, well, yeah, you yeah, I know, you've had five husbands and the one you're with now you're not even married to. He, he revealed to her her life, but he did it out of love. What did that woman feel 
Why did that woman not just get offended and, you know, chase off? She felt the love of God Almighty, and she went back to her town and said, you got to come. you got to hear what this man is saying here. I met a man that told me my whole life. Why? Because she understood what was coming from Jesus when he said, I know you. The intimacy of the life that we have in this rest, that we have in Jesus Christ, is what that woman felt when Jesus spoke those words and said, I know you. I see you. I love you. I don't look at your past. I know your past, but I don't look at it. I love you. And that intimacy is what drew that woman to the others and say, you got to come. There's something going on here. There's something great happening. So that's where we begin or end the message today is in Hebrews 4, verse 14, where Paul writes, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's God's covenant with man. You know, recently we executed a covenant with an insurance company for the church here. And in that insurance covenant, they call it a binder. We paid for the policy. We received an actual binder, a book, full of all of the pages of that covenant. And they were stamped, paid, completed. The binder is in effect. And you could not bind that policy over the phone or over some... Yeah, please give us some music there. You couldn't do it just off to the side. That binder, that covenant, had to be signed together in person, one-on-one, -on -one, so that it became effective. That's God's covenant with us. He's paid for it. When Jesus said, all things are yours, when he says that I seat you, in heavenly places. When he says that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you. He's saying, I stamped it. I paid for this. I already took care of this binder. It's all taken care of. You're insured. You're covered. That's a, the mercy of our God. That's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we declare to you this day, that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, is here to save. If there's anybody in here that feels that tug in your heart, to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior, please come forward. We'll pray for you. If there's anybody that needs healing, anybody that needs to be filled, Holy Ghost. If you just need a touch from God, we're here to minister. 
through the Holy Ghost and fire. So let's stand to our feet here as we just give God his time. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the promises that we can hold to, that we can read, that we can see for ourselves that they are examples for our lives to make sure that we don't fall or get carried away into any part of unbelief. Lord, take any rebellion out of our lives. Take any thought captive that needs to be directed to you. We desire more, Lord. You said that we would be blessed, that we would be blessed as we hunger and thirst after your righteousness. We declare, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are king. We thank you, Lord Jesus, again, for the mothers, the females, all the women in this house, those that are watching online, those that aren't here right now, those in this city, in this state, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for life. I thank you for healing. I thank you for wisdom. I thank you, Lord, for the impartation of that power. I thank you for healing on cramped legs. I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for healing in our lungs. I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for healing in our legs. I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, healing and deliverance. I thank you for the price that you paid. I thank you that you took that insurance binder, that covenant, and he paid it for us. We give you glory. We give you thanks. We give you all the honor. Do your name. I thank you for the testimony of a good report that my numbers are up. Brother told me before the service started, he said, my numbers are way up. And I didn't know what to think. Is that good? Is that bad? I'm not quite sure what my numbers being up means, but to him, he was good. Where they were in very low numbers, He's up into the thousands. That's good. That's good stuff. We're seeing God move. We're seeing again things happening that give us peace and release to do whatever it takes to allow God to continue healing in our bodies. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. You are a good good father I pray for long life long beautiful life for our elderly I thank you God for working the miraculous I thank you God that we can declare it not just as someone that's just beating the air we are declaring it by the word of Jesus Christ that he lives, that he died, and he rose again. Our God is good. Amen.